With the COVID-19 um, pandemic upon us, the faculty of Columbia University School of Social Work um, have mobilized to form the COVID-19 Action Initiative. Um, the mission of it is, to, is monitoring developments and disseminating information that can be helpful to social workers and the clients that we serve. Um, so today, um, speaking on staying close from a distance um, and social support, we have um, Dr. Susan Witte, our Columbia University School of Social Work professor. Um, and then we also are excited to have Dr. Carolina Velez Grohl um, from the NYU Silver School of Social Work. So um, thank you both and want to go ahead and turn the mic over to you guys. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, welcome everyone and thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, for some of you, this might be a double header. If you listen to John Robertson and Bob, uh, Rob Hartley earlier, thank you so much. And um, we're really delighted to be here today. Um, I wanna thank the COVID-19 action team and to thank all of you for your commitment to volunteering during this time in response to our action. Um, I wanna take a moment to give a Lenape land acknowledgement. I'm calling in from Rockland County and my work is in New York City and these are Lenape lands. Wherever you are, I encourage you to know who are the indigenous uh, peoples who came before and on whose land you may be. Um, typically they were unseated and uh, we're grateful for, um, for the opportunity to be here um, and acknowledging um, that they came before us. Um, I also would like to take a moment of silence for um, the 100,000 people uh, soon in the United States who have lost their lives um, to COVID-19 and to the family members and friends and communities of those who are now working through ways to cope without them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I've been a social worker and intervention scientist for about 30 years. And um, during that time, social work practices evolved considerably and we've heard more about evidence-based practices and we've done a lot more scientific research and interventions related to our practice. And today we're here to talk about social support which um, has a long history of course. And one of the reasons why um, it's especially important to me. Um, I actually first became more aware of it as a concept in my doctoral program with Dr. Alex Gitterman, who many of you may know, who's now at the University of Connecticut, um, and who wrote a seminal book on mutual aid in social work and social support. And mutual aid and social supports have always been the common collective element that ties us together. And it's, it's uh, truest to social work because it's, it's an, a resource that we all have. It's not something outside of what we have. It's not something that we have to learn. We actually, we give it, we experience it, uh, we receive it. And it's something that I think, uh, for, especially for first year uh, social work students and people who are new to working in social work, it is a way to identify a resource that's easily accessible, that gives them the immediate capacity to reach out and to assist another person by identifying what strengths they have in their own life and space. Um, and I just, before I turn it over to Carolina, want to say in terms of um, an awareness of my own positionality, uh, particularly as a social work professor, as part of the COVID-19 action group, as a human being living in community during COVID-19, uh, that as a white woman who's a faculty member and who has access to everything I need, I'm, it's not lost on me that the inconveniences of working from home or the barriers that I suffer are not um, equatable with the life-threatening experiences that many in my community are experiencing. And I think that this is an important piece of awareness that we've been holding as a COVID-19 action team as we move forward. Great. So thank you and uh, hello everyone. It is really a pleasure for me to, to join my dear mentor and colleague, Dr. Susan Witte and all of you who uh, were able to sign in today. It's very exciting to see people from, from Maryland, Palm Beach, Westchester, New Jersey, New York, Dallas. It's really exciting. So thank you for joining us today. 
I am a provost postdoctoral fellow and assistant professor at uh, NYU Silver School of Social Work. Um, I worked with Susan uh, while I was doing my doctoral program at Columbia University, and, and I, I helped developing the, the course that we are going to present to you, to you today. Uh, my work uh, focuses on social connectedness and suicide among racial and ethnic minority youth. I'm originally from Colombia, and I identify as a Latina here in the United States. Um, so welcome, everybody. So our learning outcomes for today are three main ones, name and identify forms of informal and formal supports and the predominant theories that inform social support and health and mental health to describe the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has compromised our social support cross-culturally, really globally, while forcing new emerging meaning and types of support. And finally, we'd like to describe, we'd like for you to be able to, at the end of this talk, to describe and use and train others in a specific online social support networking map tool that we had developed uh, for evidence-based uh, health promotion interventions and social work practice. So we will be covering uh, the definition of social support, social support on health and mental health, including a brief history of social support, types of social support and theories. We will also review the impact of COVID-19 uh, pandemic in, in our communities. Um, and we will discuss the impact, particularly for Latinx community, a population that has been greatly affected by this pandemic. Finally, we will introduce and demonstrate uh, demonstrate the social network map tool and leave a uh, time for questions. So we would like to start our presentation with this quote from Paulo Freire, who is a Brazilian educator. You might be familiar with his work. And he says that what is required to transform the world is a dialogue, critical questioning, and love for humanity. And we start with Brieri because, as many of you know, because you've been following this series, about a month ago this Thursday, only four weeks ago, Ellen Lukens and Yamila Marti did our first presentation on psychoeducation. And so the roots of this work is in psychoeducation. The, the term of knowledge is power comes from Freire, and many of these principles are Freirean. Um, and that one of the key components or key principles in psychoeducation is individual, family, and community strength and support. So social supports are paramount to the ways in which we support each other and we support others in strengthening their supports. Um, and in the spirit of psychoeducation today, we would also very much like to make this interactive. So we hope you'll feel free, as Tiffany said, to use the chat box in the Q&A, and we'll stop and do some polls to check in to see what your thoughts are about what we're doing. Um, but this should actually be transactional. We should be learning together and co-learning. So please um, see yourself as very much an active part of this presentation. So we wanted to um, emphasize that for this present presentation, we would like to talk about physical distance uh, as opposed to social distancing, because we um, acknowledge that uh, at this point, maybe more than ever, we need the social support and the social connection that our families and friends uh, can provide to us. Right. And I think that one of the, the first things that every social worker reacted to early on was this concept of social distancing, because we all knew that it wasn't really social distancing that we needed, but physical distancing, and that there's a big difference. So what is social support? We hear the term all the time. It's pretty ubiquitous. Um, it's an exchange of resources between at least two people, could be many more, perceived by the provider or the recipient to be intended to enhance the well-being of the recipient. So let's just pause for a second and take that in. It's a reciprocal exchange and it's perceived to enhance the well-being of the recipient. It reduces or buffers the adverse psychological impacts of exposure to stressful life events and to ongoing life strains. And ultimately, social support 
is the glue that binds the collective experience. And we know historically, cross-culturally, that in collective societies, in collective experiences, there's great strength. And we'll continue to talk about that throughout the presentation today, but ultimately it brings us together. So social support is critical in health and mental health. And there's a history, we're gonna describe the types, we're gonna talk about the roles and the theories. A very brief history, because we only have an hour, would be to ground social support in the work of Mary Richmond and Jane Addams. So Mary Richmond, as you know, was uh, one of our first uh, social workers to develop social casework among new immigrants in the US and in New York. And uh, she helped to identify informal and formal supports of individuals in order to strengthen their capacity to cope. Jane Addams was of course our, uh, the mother of settlement houses and settlement houses were based in community supports, building from the individual level to the community level. And then the three other touch points on this timeline would be in 1954, um, an anthropologist named John Barnes was the first to actually study closely knit networks. So in other words, in Norway, he studied, he lived within a, net, um, within a society and he started to identify the connection of networks between people. And he found that the exchange of support within a close knit network exerted influence on members to conform to social norms. And he also was the first to look at the difference between homogeneous networks where people are very similar compared to more heterogeneous networks. Homogeneous networks tend to be better or more effective at providing effective and instrumental support. John Cassell in the 1970s was the first scientist as an epidemiologist to publish findings that can demonstrate that social support actually is a key protective factor in health and mental health. Of course, there are many, many studies that have come since that time, and there's a very rich empirical literature on the role that social support plays. We'll touch on stress and coping theories, but just so that you know, and if anyone has questions about more of that history or the empirical base, please let us know. And then we wanted to highlight that it was in the 1990s that there was a resurgence in the social work literature, particularly by Tracy and Whitaker, who developed specific tools that were social network maps. And they were loosely based on eco maps, but they were a little bit more specific in trying to identify types of support in individuals' networks. As uh, we just mentioned, social support is one of the important functions of social relationships, and it is commonly categorized into four types of behaviors, emotional, informational, social companionship, and instrumental. And we will look at uh, each of them in, in a minute. So emotional support is being accepted by others, feeling cared and loved by others, uh, give us self uh, worth and enhance our self-esteem. For example, close friends and family members who listen and, uh, and validate our, family, our feelings are important part of that emotional support. Mm -hmm. Informational support refers to receiving information that help us understand and problem solve and cope with difficulties. It is a piece of advice or appraisal. For instance, someone who knows um, who knows us and remind us of the qualities uh, we have to be able to overcome a difficult situation, or a person who tells us information about where to find a job or, or um, where to find food or different resources that we need. The third one is social companionship. Uh, and this is uh, spending time with others in leisure activities that help us distract from the stress. Uh, it's connecting with others for example, a friend who loves uh, the movies and you know that she or he will be a great companionship when you want to watch a movie. Finally, instrumental uh, support is being provided with tangible goods or services. For example, a friend who offers to watch the kids while you go to the doctor. So there are really specific and, 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 and tangible things that people offer to you or also organizations. Mm -hmm. So we just want to pause now and ask you a poll question. Uh, and the polling question is, um, what type of social support do you need most right now? 
And I believe Caitlin will be releasing that poll. If you would just take a moment and you can respond uh, to any of them. But if you would just take a moment and think, what type of support do you feel the need uh, for right now most? We're just gonna wait 15 seconds for people to have a chance to complete it. Okay, Caitlin, how did we do? Let's see what we said. Okay, wow. So we see overwhelmingly emotional support is the uh, 40, at 47%, people are feeling the need for emotional support and then social support. And frankly, informational and practical support is, is quite a bit lower. That's very interesting. Um, so let's keep that in mind as we uh, move along. And so we want to introduce this concept of a network because we hear a lot about the term uh, social networks. And so not to confuse the two, to distinguish them, social support are those types of supports that we were talking about. And the network is actually, it's a person-centered web of social relationships. And so the, the picture depicted is the most helpful that, that I have in my head to think about one's network. And it's also a theoretical construct that we use to describe the connection of social supports that we use to study social support. So many of you who do research um, might be very familiar with this construct of a social network. I think right now when we hear about contact tracing, contact tracing that's going on as a, as a, a critical practice in order for us to be able to return um, to um, the workspaces and the places that we had to go to before is part of a, uh, examining what a social network is. Um, because what you would be doing is um, considering who has come in contact with an individual who might become infected with COVID-19. But another important component of the term social network is many of you will remember the movie Social Network, right? Which was based on the origins of Facebook and uh, social media. So social media as a social support is another critical aspect of, uh, of what's happening right now in terms of COVID-19. Um, if you uh, look here at the, on the left side of the screen, we just have an image that captures very quickly some of the most predominant forms of social media. Um, what is striking about thinking about social media in my mind is on the right hand side, this um, it says, how big is Facebook? So when we first developed the course in 2015 and I started to do some research on the size of social media, at that point, Facebook, if it were a country by population would have been the third largest in the world. But since 2016, it has eclipsed China in the number of monthly active users. So one way to think of that would be if the population of Facebook were a country, we could say that it would be the largest. So as a form of connection it is extremely powerful and there have been um, many again empirical publications about the important value of a social media network like facebook for example for as you know things like health and mental health so good information when it's spread through contagion on social media can be very helpful bad information can be very very harmful and uh, we see this even as we um, are examining the information available about safe um, physical distancing and measures to take in order to be healthy and to get good mental health support during COVID-19. Um, okay, so we wanted to take another moment for uh, a poll to ask you, uh, because it's not really been categorized, where do you think social media falls as a form of social support? Do you think it fall, falls most uh, in terms of emotional, informational, social, or practical support or some combination as you think about your uses of social media? For what purpose do you find that you might use social media? We'll give it 10 more seconds and then uh, Caitlin will share the results. Oh, 
Okay, social support. So predominantly 58% feel that they will, they, they use social media for social support, uh, but some do use it for information, be careful, um, and for emotional support and for practical support. Excellent, very helpful. Um, okay, I do see on the chat that there is a question. Um, there was an earlier question uh, that was um, related to gender and social supports. And um, I wonder if we want to go back to that or Ellen, if there's a, a question that you want to type out in the chat. Um, there is uh, one question here, uh, Susan says, uh, are the numbers you mentioned in the number of Facebook users in comparison to a country control for fake accounts? No, not necessarily. That's something that we would have, I would have to go back to the source of the information to see. I don't think that Facebook can control for that. And so they don't know. So no, I would say no, it doesn't control for that. And that's a very good point. Uh, there was an earlier question about gender in social support. And I think what is not surprising, uh, we find that more often the types of support like emotional and advice sharing um, and social supports are, um, are enacted by women and groups of women and less so among men. And so the, the very stereotypical uh, gender stereotypes uh, may hold true. Uh, but I think we see that shifting. We definitely see that shifting depending on which population or group or issue for work we're seeing. Is there another question just now? Yeah, there's uh, just a general question about um, the fact that somebody could not sign in until 1220 and the consequences for their CEUs. Um, oh, okay. We could we talk to, well, maybe we can have Tiffany help us with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yep, I actually just responded back to that person directly. And any um, CE related questions um, can be sent to um, SWOPE um, at Columbia.edu, which I will go ahead and write that in a chat right now. Um, so then that way, you know, everything else could be content related to the presentation. Great. Okay, so we're going to get back to this. There's three major functions of social support for health sustaining and stress reducing. The first is gratification of affiliative needs, right? So when we are with our friends or supports, they decrease our feelings of isolation and loneliness and they increase our feelings of worth and belonging. The second is a maintenance and enhancement of our self-identity. So who I am and how I develop and see myself in the world positively or negatively as my personality develops is as a response to the social supports in my environment. Um, and in terms of self-esteem enhancement, our social supports will validate our sense of value and adequacy. And these three major functions map onto the three key theories that have been studied in social support. And so the first, which would be uh, social exchange theory, is the giving and the receiving of support. And that maps onto the gratification of affiliative needs and making us feel <clears throat> if we're go to go back, uh, making us feel worthwhile and that we belong and that we're not isolated and we're not, uh, we're not alone. Um, so social exchange theory, which again has been studied um, quite well and is used very often in understanding how it can help buffer stress and, um, and uh, it, difficult interactions is mapped on there. And social competence is the second. And social competence theory is related to how we effectively interact with our environment or not. So some of us are more socially competent than others. Some of us find it very comfortable and easy to um, interact with others. And that speaks to the maintenance and the enhancement of our self-identity as our personality develops. And so the degree to which I feel that I'm competent in my social network and supported strengthens that sense of self-identity. And the third is the social comparison theory. And this one, um, the easiest uh, go-to for me is Facebook. Um, I'm actually not on Facebook anymore, but when I was, um, I couldn't help but think a lot that we compare ourselves to others. And there's a self-esteem enhancement component to this, um, to this social comparison theory that likens back to this idea of self-esteem enhancement and a validation of one's value and adequacy as we connect. So these are the three key foundations. And we're um, gonna talk a little bit now 
about stress so mm -hmm. that we can connect it back to social support. Uh, Susan, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh huh. So uh, s uh, someone in the audience is saying, I'm curious how we support adolescents during this time who desperately need interaction with their peers and mm -hmm. are beginning to find themselves feeling burned out by technology-based interactions. Ah, well, so how do you connect in, in an age where we're not allowed to be physically um, closer yet uh, without technology? Um, well, so let's hold on to that and let me write it down and come back to it because I do think that some of the ways that we've been using technology is helping, but the physical distancing is something um, quite specific that we won't be able to address until we're connected. But it may be uh, for adolescents that phone connections, which they don't often use, would be one way to be able to connect that wouldn't necessarily be um, so disconcerting. So we'll talk in a little bit about uh, how Zoom is both a strength for technology and connection, but also can be very disconcerting because of the nature of um, viewing each other in real time um, in, in ways that we're not actually sitting together in real time. But a phone call might be a very nice way for some adolescents to be able to connect with others. So, so let me hold right. on to that and go back to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also want to add perhaps the uh, writing letters, uh, writing cards, is, is a really um, handy and, and concrete way to, to connect with others. But yes, we would go back to that. Yeah, yeah there are a few more questions about that, so we'll, I'll hold them. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So we wanted to talk about stress uh, because in order to understand the role that social support plays in our lives, we need to understand the role that it plays in stress and coping. So what is stress? Stress is a, a strong, uh, is a yeah, strong network of, um, sorry, sorry. It's, a, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's our body's way to respond to a threat or life demands. We, uh, when we sense danger, whether it's real or imagined, our body responds through a myriad of behaviors and physiological mechanisms to get things back to normal. And that includes physiological reactions uh, that can be, for instance, rapid heart rate, body pains, exhaustion. Mm -hmm. it, it also encompasses behavioral and cognitive reactions that can be getting angry, trying to get control of the things and situations, avoiding situations, um, also interacting with others and taking a break and sociocultural components like the appraisals about the situations of causes of stress. There are three major categories of stress. Um, life events, which are acute changes, including major behavioral changes for a short period of time. Uh, chronic strains, which are persistent and recurrent demands that require readjustments over a prolonged uh, period of time and daily hassles, the daily things that occur in our lives. And I think we, we wanted to um, put in perspective how COVID-19 um, has exacerbated all these situations of stress and uh, it's, it's an unprecedented situation that is happening to all of us and bring all of these uh, major categories of stress, right? We, I think uh, when we, what we hear from, from the people around us, from the, uh, the students that we work with and the clients is that there is the difficulties balancing uh, work and family, finances, job insecurity, um, expectations from supervisors, decision fatigue, lack of control. So all of these are um, stressors that we are feeling right now and are in those three categories. And we wanted to show this um, model just very quickly to discuss two of these. And the, the first on the left is uh, Hans Seeley's model. And Hans Seeley was um, really the father uh, of stress research because he recognized that all humans experience stress. So our modern day language suggests that stress is something that is not normal or regular, that we have to address it. But in fact, biologically, stress is a natural part of being alive. 
Um, and so we all experience it and our bodies are coping with stress all the time. And we wanted to just make that distinction. And so what Hans Seeley said is to be totally without stress would to be without life. So it would be to be dead. So it's good to have stress. Um, but he identified stress as a demand on an organism that requires us to adapt or to cope or to adjust. But it's just daily wear and, tail, uh, wear and tear on the body. And then Lazarus's model, um, which we'll talk about in, in a minute, talks about how we appraise stress and how we can function and cope and how social supports can help us there. So Hans Seeley says it's not the stress that kills us, it's our reaction to it. So let's keep that in mind. It's, it has everything to do with how we react. The assumption is we're under different levels of stress always and our coping depends on uh, the way that we can engage supports in response. This is the Lazarus and Folkman transactional model of stress. And so what we see is, you know, a situation or an event takes place and we appraise it very quickly. If there's no threat perceived, there's no real stress that's um, exacerbating us beyond our relative comfort. But if there's a perceived threat, the secondary appraisal then either tells us that, oh, we have the capacity to cope. This is where our social supports come in. Either I feel that I have the resources and the supports to cope, or I feel I have an inability to cope with the threat. And this is where we might get differences between more positive stressors and more negative stressors. And our concerns right now through, through COVID-19 are with those who are overwhelmed with many negative stressors. Susan, there's a question that fits well here. Okay. Someone's saying sometimes const constantly viewing social media gets overwhelming because there are too many conflicting or competitive information and opinions posted. How to manage the stress while still using social media as a proper support resource? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. And I suspect that many people would have different responses to that. My own response would be, and, and what I have found to be helpful and what's helpful for my teens is actually um, limiting the time that we spend exposed to social media. So trying to vary the time and reduce some of the immersion so that we do have time away from it. Um, and so I, th I think that might be one approach. Carolina, what, what yes. are your thoughts on that? I, I, will, I will agree with that, Susan. And I think setting boundaries for yourself in terms of how much information you're exposed to uh, is, is an important part of taking care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I find and I know that many um, people I've spoken to since March, uh, actually, I would say before March, that social media tends to be something that what we know from the literature can be a distraction that we welcome in order to avoid being in the present, right? So we talk a lot about mindfulness and the value of mindfulness exercises. And I think the same is true now. I think COVID-19 presents such an exacerbation of stressors that we tend to look to reading, to media, to distract ourselves from sort of accepting being in the present moment. So if, if you find that, or if you hear that in anyone you're working with and setting the boundaries that Carolina is discussing or taking a quiet walk without your phone, if that's possible, or mm -hmm. finding time to spend without some technology, even for a brief time would, would be very helpful, I think. Um, so how does social support influence coping with stress? There's two main approaches. And, and I promise this is the end of our sort of technical slides, but we felt like this background was important to get us thinking about what role social support plays. So the main effect suggests that social support is always helpful, whether in times of stress or not. Essentially, I think more is better. The more friends you have, the more people who are around you, social support can be very helpful. And that's one of the theories. The second theory that's actually more prominent in the literature for health and mental health is called the buffering effect. And what that means is that social support helps us to buffer our experiences of stress by providing the support that enables us to reappraise the situation. So remember what Folkman and Lazarus said, if we experience a stressor and if we reflect on who we can call, who's the first person I'm going to call, or who's that person I'm going to see later today. And if the connections with those supports 
remind us that we have the capacity to tolerate to some extent and to cope, that buffering effect kicks in. And what we see in a lot of the literature is the buffering effect is where we see better mental health outcomes. So I would call that it's not so bad. It's not going to be so bad because I do have these capacities, the social support. So the main effect and the buffering effect are the two key ways that you'll see if you're reading empirical papers and they're testing for social support, you might see that they look at a buffering effect to moderate outcomes. So when I do uh, HIV prevention research and when we're working with women, for example, who engage in, in sex work in order to support themselves through income, but they want to shift their income to some other form of income so that they're not at high risk, part of that process is developing a series of supports in their lives who can help them. And we often find that the stress or the level of distress and anxiety that women experience over the course of that intervention is mitigated by their capacity to reach out to supports. And so that's the basis for our social support network mapping and our encouragement to look at supports um, and assess them in each person's life. Mm -hmm. So we also wanted to stop right here and ask if there are other questions that have come up. So there are quite a number of uh, really interesting questions. Um, one has a, a couple, one following up on the question about adolescents asking um, how to support adolescents with special needs throughout this, these circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, related to that, um, well, maybe address that one first, and then there's one about children as well. So, so special needs could mean many things, right? It sounds like um, maybe in the absence of more information, it might be more difficult to, to respond directly. But I, but I think in thinking about, um, uh, again, wanting to embrace technology to the extent that it is useful. I see many people in the chat talking who work with adolescents regularly speaking to the value of video chats or Google Hangouts or to uh, phone connections. Um, uh, I think maybe choosing a social media forum or format that might be one that's specifically for um, kids with special needs, and I could do some research on that, and we can get back to you about that. I think that might be of value, or you might research that. Carolina, do you have um, examples from your practice? Oh, I think with the community that we were, there are several uh, children and adolescents with uh, some disabilities, and, and I think the important part is to support parents right now on dealing with the children and adolescents and give them a lot of parenting skills uh, and hopefully create a, a support network that can allow for these parents to take times off uh, so that they don't feel overwhelmed uh, by taking care uh, of, of the children 24 seven. Uh, so I think part of, of the children when they are especially young, very young, is to provide parents with a lot of support and, and, and parent, parenting skills. Great. And then there's a, a question about um, the impact on children. Uh, what is the emotional developmental impact of social physical distancing on children to quote unquote us in the field? This seems highly consequential. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when we're thinking about physical versus um, so, uh, social distancing, I think, again, uh, I, would, I would defer to this idea that within uh, families and within spaces, we do know that kids have great imaginations and can, can manage. We know from the developmental literature that even children who have spent time in isolation can uh, develop quite uh, well and normally that there's not necessarily, just because one is more physically isolated doesn't mean that they don't have that capacity. I think we need to remember that right now, this is a short term, we hope, relatively short term period of time. We're talking about six to nine months, maybe um, nine months to a year, but we're also seeing that as we're opening up, quote unquote, that we're starting to reduce uh, the physical distancing concerns to create ways for a new normal, right? New ways to get together social distancing. And I would predict that in the next six months, even in terms of parks that we may be 
uh, opening up. And I see people are pointing out that kids can't physically distance. I suspect we're going to have to find new ways to help to kids to understand that they will have to. And so this is going to be a whole new area uh, for school teachers and for parents that um, they'll have to be managing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people One of the things... Yeah, go, uh, go ahead, Carolyn. That I, I have uh, read and, and heard from other colleagues who work with children and are uh, experts in, in child and adolescent is to really be forthcoming and uh, honest with the child, explaining mm -hmm. what is happening and why uh, physical distancing is important. Although, as we initially mentioned, physical distancing doesn't equate social distancing. Um, I, I think this is, is, is important to explain these these things to children. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I myself wonder about the consequences of trusting others um, and, and the relationships that we will have uh, after we transition to, to, to our work, uh, works and, and schools. Yeah. And, and I, I see that Lucia has mentioned too that, that all, of course all ages are affected and we know that for the population of um, older individuals that they are prone to a particular kind of loneliness. I mean, there can be um, uh, the lack of intergenerational contact. There can be um, a feeling of not contributing to society, which is what we talked about earlier. And also this sense of existential loneliness, right? That people may feel, older individuals might be feeling like um, you know, wondering if their lives are going to end shortly for reasons that are outside of their control and that uh, they're concerned about getting the care they need. So while all of these are, are very real um, considerations and concerns, I think what we want to continue to get to how we can intentionally identify the social supports that individuals have, both um, children, families, parents for their children, um, and also um, uh, aging and older adults in order to invite new ways to think about those supports. Because I think maybe one of the most important things we haven't really emphasized is that it's perceived social support that really impacts our mental health. It doesn't even have to be real, believe it or not. When you measure perceived social support, my sense that I'm supported predicts how I will cope better than the reality of how often I am in touch with people. So it's a very real um, sense of uh, perception. And so strengthening that perception among individuals can come from our virtual counseling. And um, so, so let's stop there and just keep going to make sure we get through uh, the next section, yes. but save your questions and we'll check in again shortly. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to just look at what life has been like since March and uh, think about the social support during COVID-19. And we just had a few main points. So one is this idea of physical distancing during sheltering or lockdown, which is a very harsh term. Um, and we talked about how that is not the same as social distancing. We talked about daily chronic and emergent stressors that are leading to compromised mental health, the lack of traditional access to social supports, but that isolation doesn't have to equal loneliness and that there are new ways of staying connected and feeling supported. These are some of the images of the new normal, quote unquote, with masks, having to hand wash. And again, these are taken globally from uh, different uh, news outlets. Um, and the older uh, woman who's behind the window, we see lots of people having to visit just now uh, through windows and through barriers, but they're still able to see one another. Um, and the mask has become, until we have a vaccine or uh, treatment, it will become a new type of uh, wear that we will see globally to try to reduce respiratory um, infection. Zoom is the new way in which many of us interact. Um, it has its pros and cons. What we see here are some of the examples of being able to be collective and send messages some of you may have seen the YouTube videos of different actions, different pieces of music that have been streamed together by many people um, on a Zoom call. Uh, our graduations uh, have been held here at the, uh, the uh, Social Work School. This year, we had some fantastic uh, graduation experiences on Zoom. And uh, so this new way of connecting using Zoom has many great strengths. One of the weaknesses is 
uh, by some neuroscientists who are saying that when uh, many of you have probably read the, the few articles that have come out recently, is that when we're interacting like this, and I'm looking at you on the, through a camera and Carolina is looking back at me, that there's meta communications that are having to be adjusted for unconsciously that can create the stress of this kind of an interaction. So while not perfect, it is a way that we can stay connected and collective, but we have to keep in mind as social workers that that could be somewhere in tear for the overuse, but also understanding that it's not perfect. Um, and if, as long as we're aware of the pros and cons, we can go into any conversation and encouragement of connecting via Zoom with some strengths. These are images again from India, from Italy, from um, Colombia, uh, from Spain, from Madrid, of uh, people on balconies in apartment complexes in urban areas who are able to reach out and connect, playing music, singing songs together, uh, celebrating at the end of the day, and three months from now, these are not images that we perhaps would have thought that we would have um, been accessing in, in our work. But uh, these are the everyday experiences for many. And again, it's a, gonna be a new way to connect with social supports. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Carolina for uh, the next. So this, this um, we wanted to share with you this image from taking from my, from my building, from my window, uh, as Susan and I were uh, working to prepare this presentation, uh, we heard people clapping every uh, night at seven o'clock and we wanted to share with you how cheerful um, this is uh, and has become a moment for recognition of health workers, essential workers, those who work in the supermarkets, those who uh, work in, in all restaurants and are um, made possible that we stay at home safe. Um, and it also has become an important part of uh, greeting neighbors and, and making sure that everybody is okay. Ah, so it doesn't appear to be uh, going on. I don't know why the audio is not working. Let's see. Ah, I can't hear the audio. It has an audio, but it doesn't appear to be working just now. Do you want to see if you can uh, bring it up, Carolina, in your PowerPoint to share? Yes, let's see if it does work. You tell me when and I'll stop sharing. For some reason, it's not opening here. Uh, a shame. Okay, well, we'll keep going. But what this was, it was an audio of one minute. As we were putting this presentation together, it, seven o'clock came in New York City where Carolina lives. And uh, the sound of people cheering and banging pots, pots and pans for the healthcare workers and other uh, frontline people working in the supermarkets, as Carolina said, was just overwhelming and brought tears to our eyes. So. We wanted to share that, but the technology is not going to allow for it just now. So, okay, so how to assess social support needs and how may we strengthen social support? Uh, we wanted to be mindful of the impact that um, COVID-19 has had on many communities, but particularly the Latinx community in New York City. So Carolina is going to um, tell us about some work she's been doing that set us up for demonstrating the social support map. Yes. So we, we really, as Susan just said, um, we're thinking about how COVID-19 has exacerbated structural inequalities, especially for some communities. And as you might know, the Latinx community has been dramatically affected by the pandemic. Reports from the New York State Department of Health indicate that the death rates for Latinx individuals surpassed the deaths of Black, White, and Asian individuals. There is an alarming concentration of COVID-19 cases in the Bronx and other low resource uh, neighborhoods in Queens and Brooklyn, where minority families of color, uh, particularly Latinx, live. So we would like to share with you the experiences of families affected by COVID-19. Uh, these families live in the Bronx, and you might know that the Bronx is the poorest district in the United States 
and it's a community that ranks high risk in economic, housing, educational, and employment insecurity. We learn about these families through our work in connection with the Mexican Coalition, a small nonprofit agency in the South Bronx. I know these organizations in uh, 2014 when Dr. Ellen Lukens introduced me with Jairo Guzman, who is the CEO of the organization. And since then, I have been working providing uh, voluntary workshops and most recently, we developed a telehealth intervention to support mothers with toxic stress. So to understand how uh, to respond to the needs of the Latinx families during COVID-19, the Mexican coalition launched a survey that was answered by 160 of the families they serve. And um, more than two thirds of these families have lived in New York City for more than 14 years. And yet they don't have the protections that most of us in New York are eligible to receive because they're immigrant status. 78% of these families reported that they don't have enough funds to pay for their monthly expenses, including rent, food, electricity, gas, internet, which is very important to stay connected. And this is particularly concerning given that 91% of these families are raising children that are under 18. Mm -hmm. So we thought it would be important to put um, a life seal a cycle of the um, how COVID-19 has impacted these families that are served by these uh, non-profit agency in the South Bronx. And so during the during pregnancy, we see that um, mothers lack appropriate nutrition and are uh, facing food insecurity. Uh, they lack in appropriate prenatal care and they are giving birth in isolation, separated from their families and showing some symptoms of anxiety and depression and sleep problems. In the childhood and adolescent years, we're seeing that adolescents are uh, complaining about this limited space at home, lack of privacy, school insecurity, lack of internet that might impact teens' ability to connect with their friends, um, lack of resources to e-learning, and we know that uh, Latinx are, over, are really behind educationally. So this is going to put this, this population even at uh, farther and it's going to increase the gap, educational gap. Uh, they are also worrying about family and financial insecurity, fear about parents and family members getting sick and expressing anxiety and depressive symptoms. For adults, uh, of course, this, this Structural inequalities that they were before are exacerbated at a magnified level. Um, and I think I wanted to emphasize here that even though Latinx are the are considered essential workforce, they, they don't have enough protections from our systems. So adults um, report economic stress. Uh, and this economic stress imposed uh, to these families, along with the disparities in access to food, education, and housing, will impact parents' ability to meet their children's basic and emotional needs, and in turn will affect the tight knit relationships, which is known to be essential for uh, protective factor for youth growing in poverty. We're also seeing that families are getting sick themselves and dying, uh, family members are dying, uh, are dying in isolation, and there are a uh, lack of uh, religious and proper funeral uh, services, which is a concern given uh, the cultural values of these families. So we would like to introduce you um, with the social support network uh, tool and to demonstrate uh, how to use this tool with the context of these vulnerable, vulnerable families in mind. Mm -hmm. So the social support network map is a web-based tool. It was evolved from a paper-based uh, social network tool, which was used in the 1990s. And we evolved it towards the late 90s and into the 2000s. And I did this with, in development um, with uh, members of the investigative team at the Social Intervention Group. Um, as I referenced before, we were interested in creating um, tools for our HIV prevention interventions. And as we decided to make those web-based interventions, we needed to identify web-based tools. Um, and so uh, 
we want to demonstrate that tool. This is a free tool, by the way. And so as I uh, unshare the screen and go to the tool, you'll see how to access it just like anyone else. And um, we, we all have the capacity. Um, in a great world or in a perfect tech world, I would just click on this and it would go right there, but that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I am going to um, unshare, stop sharing my screen and you will see, uh, I'll reshare. Let's see how I can reshare. Share screen. I'm going to go to Google. And um, if you watch, I'm going to type in SSNM for Social Support Network Map. Um, dot ctl dot Columbia dot edu, the edu. And um, we'll have that in the slides so everyone can see. But if you click on that, it'll take you to this site. And at this site, there's a tutorial. There are two videos. There you can see me in a younger version. And the two tutorials will introduce you to the map and talk about how to use it. But since we're live, we're going to take you through that uh, ourselves. And so you just would click on uh, map tool if you want to create the map. And it takes you to this uh, space, social support network map tool. Let's create a new map. And so I just wanted to say a few things um, before we get started. Um, the concept of mapping, again, uh, came about because we realized, and in the literature it's reflected, that we often take for granted who these people are who comprise our social networks. But until we actually have a graphical image and talk through who it is that we're in contact with on a daily basis and how close they are to us and what they can do for us, we don't really hold that awareness in a way that it can become useful as an interventive tool. So network maps are increasingly used to assess social support. So if someone is struggling and they need support, we can ha sit with them and talk them through creating this map just to help them think about who possibly could be out there. And it really works with psychoeducation. It really works with even MI, which we saw a presentation of last week, because it does allow for an opportunity to reflect gently on who I identify, for example, who's in my network. Mm -hmm. And we talk about using it to specifically identify a problem for work. So you could create a network map for yourself that's everybody in your life, but a more useful use of the tool would be to identify an issue for work. And in this case, Carolina is gonna take over and, and lead a demonstration where I need childcare and that becomes the issue for work. So when we say, what would you like to name the map? It should be related to the issue for work. So Carolina, take it away. Yes. So we are going to illustrate the case of um, a woman who uh, suspects she has the uh, symptoms of COVID-19 and as Susan just mentioned, uh, needs a uh, child care. So first, what we are going to do is to help our clients uh, introduce with this tool and maybe define a little bit so I might say, you mentioned that you suspect that you might have COVID-19 and need some assistance with uh, child care. Is that right, Susan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So sometimes in these times, it's easy to think that we are alone. And in reality, we have the support and friends and families. And this tool will allow you to identify the social network or, or the group of people that is in your life and can support you. So let's uh, uh, identify uh, the problem. Once we identify the thing that you wanted to work with, uh, we so open- So that's me and let me in the middle. <laughs> that's right, yes. Okay. So Susan, why don't we add a person? Can you think about someone who provides support for you and is there for you? Uh, Yes, uh, that would be uh, my partner. Um, and that would be, I'm going to, I'm going to call him Don. Great. So how close is uh, Don to you? Very close. So now we are going to talk about different types of support. So we, we, we know that the different people provide different things and different support to each other. They might provide companionship, they might provide uh, emotional support, um, and they might provide um, 
problem solving or uh, concrete uh, strategies. And we also know that these people can uh, have influence on us, positive, mm -hmm. um, negative, or neutral influence. Right. So what kind of influence do you think that Dan has on you? So in this case, I think uh, he, he lives next door and he's been very supportive of me and the kids. And I think that he would be a very positive support for childcare. Great. So we would be uh, having him as positive. And as I mentioned just before, we have a different types of support. And we have here the main types of support. So uh, empathy or, uh, is, is when you feel that someone listens to you, cares about you, um, and, and is, is there for you. Advice is a person who gives you a, a, an idea of how to problem solve or a listen and can also a, have a understands what are your, your strengths and, and use those strengths to a, help you find out an answer. And social are people that are around us who can distract us when we feel the stress. And practical are things that are tangible, that are concrete, like money or um, childcare or food, things like that. So, so what kind of support does uh, Dan uh, provide for you? Is, um, I can pretty much get every kind of support. So very listens to me and tells me what would be helpful often. And um, I can go over there and hang out or he comes over and hangs out with the kids and that's good. And um, also sometimes if I, um, you know, if I need some extra money before my uh, check comes in, he, he's there to help. So that's very helpful. Right. So let's describe a little bit about your relationship with Dan and perhaps how, how long have you been with him? He's been a friend for uh, about a year now. And um, so just really my rock right now. Great. So we add these little notes so that it helps you to understand what kind of a relationship you have and, and uh, how to access them for support. So Susan, I know that you mentioned your mom is part of your uh, social support, although you have mentioned that she is um, not so positive in your life. And I wanted to, to see how you consider her in this, in this map. Yeah, I think that she would not be uh, necessarily so supportive um, because she doesn't think um, I should be leaving the kids alone. So she's, uh, she gets frustrated with me. And so that becomes uh, a real conflict between us. Mm -hmm. All right. So how is the relationship of the children with the grandma? Do you think that uh, she can provide practical support to help you with childcare? It's not ideal. I think it's, they, they like it, but it's difficult for me because she's so, so opinionated and it doesn't make me feel comfortable because she uh, kind of takes over in a way that just doesn't feel very supportive. So um, she, she's okay to, to be there, but it's, but it's difficult. So um, yeah. All right. So let's put her as a social, as you said, and a, so we can write briefly a little bit of the things that you just mentioned. Um, so here we, we wanted to time out um, a little bit to just uh, let you know that um, social supports can be positive and negative and neutral. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the person identified, the mom is, is not um, a positive support. And so the map will allow us to identify those things. And when it's negative support, it means that it, it doesn't provide the support for the goal that the person have in mind for this, uh, so, uh, for this, um, for this map. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And I see there's a question in the chat about for who is the tool to be used. So the tool could be used by anyone. It could be a social worker. It could be a friend. It could be that um, one of the things that we're going to recommend is that if you decide to use it, it's very helpful to create your own map first. So actually just to go on and to experiment with it and to see how it responds to your own set of issues. So if you're thinking to yourself, okay, so you know, I could use some help around childcare right now. Who's in my network who could support me um, and add the people in and go through the process. It is very helpful and empowering to understand just where your supports lie. So as Carolina was demonstrating, you would add people one at a time. You can add as many people. There's about six spaces in each circle. So for closest to least close proximity, there's six different um, assets or, or boxes. And these could be individual people or they could also be agencies. So we might add, for example, um, for, for me, if I'm living in um, and getting services from the Mexican coalition, then I might also put that in there because my connection to Haido might be um, a very strong one for practical support right now. And so the goal is to fill out this map and then to do an assessment or an appraisal of where there are stronger or weaker types of support and to help who, so in Carolina would be helping me to um, analyze my map and to figure out who I can count on and who maybe I can't count on and how to move through to problem solve this issue. Um, so yeah. rather than feel overwhelmed, like I should be able to figure it out she's gonna help me analyze my network and figure out where I can ask for more support. And something that I wanted to ask, Susan, is that um, this is ultimately something for the client, for the person to have, right? And so uh, there is also a paper version in case mm -hmm. that you cannot access this electronic tool. And uh, the idea as we, we do it in, in clinical work is to do it collaboratively with the person. Mm -hmm. Uh, because ultimately this is going to be a, in the hands of the person. So ideally the person can have it and in moments of stress when we cannot really think about what to do, it, the map is there to remind us who we can access and who can provide support. Mm -hmm. So you can print it out and so I'm going to just show you if you were to go to print uh, what it might look like. You'll have the map there and then on the second page is also a summary of the types of support and who falls in each of the categories. And any of the notes will come up as well. So the more detailed, the more will come up. Then you can also export the map. So if you export it, you'll save it, you'll give it a file name and you'll, the password can be as simple as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The reason for the password is that this is a public tool. And so, because of HIPAA regulations, we don't want anyone to be able to access anyone else's tool. So you would only download it if you exported it onto your own computer. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't live anywhere else. So in order to be able to open it up again, if you wanted to come back to it later, when you, um, if you were to go back to the beginning of the map tool, um, if you wanted to create a new map, what you'll see is here, um, you can import a map you already made. So in other words, you might start this in a session or you might start it for yourself and save it and export it to save it. But then you might want to import your new map again and you just choose that file that you saved and put the password in. Now you don't have to remember all these details because they're here in the tutorial. If you go to the website, the tutorial will take you through and it can show you another built map that we've created. So you can uh, take time to go back here. Again, it's ssnm.ctl.columbia.edu and um, practice it um, at, at your own time and speed. So um, because we don't really have as much time as we would normally take. We typically would present it in a classroom with students and they would practice making their own maps. Then they would practice on each other. So they get a feel for what it's like to interview someone. And then they would take it to the field and practice it with um, clients or families they're working with in the field. So yeah. go ahead, Caroline. I'm gonna go so, back to the slides. Yes, uh, there are some very important questions, um, Susan, that I would like to maybe discuss. Um, I tried to put them in some 
them together for you. To All answer. right, thank you, Erin. This is very helpful. There's some wonderful questions here. And um, right. so Kelly says, asks, can you speak to the importance of distinguishing social connections from social supports? Not all relationships are supportive. Some increase stress. How do we advise others in recognizing the difference? Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think, so I think, I think that what, what we were hoping to demonstrate in the tool by showing that you can have positive, neutral, or negative support from any individual at any given time around a, a set of issues. So my, my mother in that role play might be a tremendous support sometimes, but she's very critical of my childcare. So she's not around childcare issues. And I think it is helpful um, as the, the, whoever asked this great question is pointing out is that uh, if someone stresses us out more in that particular situation, just acknowledging that and recognizing that for this issue right now, this is not someone who is so helpful. And maybe I need to create some distance or a boundary between me and that person. Um, so I, I think that's a very useful analysis to hold is that there are positive and negative supports. And then Luciana, hi Lucy, uh, asks, how do you encourage seeking social support? And this builds on what you just addressed while acknowledging and balancing the feeling of burdening others. This may be a particular concern in cross-generational relationships, parents needing support from adult children, et cetera. Sure. Well, and I, so I don't wanna take too much of Carolina's airtime. So Carolina, do you wanna to respond to that or? Um, sorry, Susan, I, Eleni, you can't repeat the question. I, I didn't, I was trying to read it and I didn't uh, hear it very well. Uh, so from Luciana, how do you encourage seeking social support while acknowledging and balancing the feeling of burdening others? This may be a particular concern in cross-generational relationships when parents need support from adult children. Yes. Um, so I think that very important part of this is the psychoeducation, right? And to be able to... Um, discuss with the client or with the person uh, boundaries and who are there in the in the different uh, types of social support and for, for what social support and and i think that um, it depends i mean th there are two things here one is maybe the, your your client is uh, the child who feel overwhelmed with the parent going to to him, uh, sometimes for uh, maybe translating things or being of support. So maybe you can um, help that 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 person to with problem some skills uh, or to try to connect with someone that can help mitigate that and take that load from him. And if it's the mother or the parent who is uh, feeling that way. Is so the same, you can uh, provide psychoeducation and, and brainstorm with that person about resources that are uh, available to them to support the load of um, supporting others. Okay. And then there's a, 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 a set of related questions having to do with that anxiety building among parents and then how that in turn increases anxiety among the children. I know this was a major issue after September 11th and it seems to be repeating itself here. As parents become more anxious, their children act out or become more anxious, et cetera. So what are some suggestions for addressing that? Right. So I, I think what we are seeing in the early literature related to higher anxiety, and I guess I would say there's, there's, there's anxiety and stress for parents related to um, kids in their, uh, that they are caring for. Um, I'm thinking about a study that we read about, uh, which it was only published a couple weeks ago because it was based on caregivers in Wuhan, China. Um, it was based on frontline workers and their experience with their families and what helped them reduce anxiety. And what they found was where they had stronger social supports within the family for emotional support and for practical support, that it helped to reduce their anxiety, which helped them their coping increase. So I think what we're thinking about during COVID-19 is 
is these transactions of support, but they're all compressed and they're all exacerbated because they're happening to everyone globally at once. But I think if we can unpack them and think of them as still sort of cyclically and transactionally being of importance, if the parent, if we can find a way to help that parent find support, even some emotional support or social support to share stories and um, to be able to share their concerns about their kids commonly with other people who are having that experience that may help reduce their anxiety. And then you can help redirect to engage in other kinds of actions. Someone earlier talked about the fact that for kids, the idea of reciprocity and support is equally important. So helping kids to be helpers could be a great way to direct fear and concern. Sharing information is very important and reassuring kids in developmental ways that you are there to care for them is critical in parenting, we know, but also engaging them in helping others could be a way to try to direct some of that feeling of hopelessness or helplessness um, that could be exacerbating. But mm -hmm. let me not, let me let Carolina respond to that. And I, uh, I agree with you, Susan. I wanted to add that maybe when we find these, these uh, uh, supports where uh, they share the same, the same uh, or similar situations that we share, uh, setting reasonable expectations about um, how much I can get done, uh, how much is, is expected from me. Um, it is, is an important part of managing the anxiety that this time produces in ourselves. And um, yeah. So we only had a few more slides and we only have a few more minutes, but we want to take more questions. So I'm, I'm not going to read through these, but basically we just wanted to let you know that <clears throat> there, there are many interventions out of 23,000 papers, there were at least 39 rigorous types of um, studies about these types of interventions that look at how to strengthen social support. And they use these kinds of tools. So they use paper-based maps. Nobody's actually studied this particular tool, which is a web-based map, but it is based on the paper-based versions. So if you're looking for more information about the value of these interventions to strengthen and change social support, we do have references that we can share. And um, our information is, is uh, there on the um, introductory screen. You can email either of us and we will be happy to share those. Um, I'm going to skip the preparation for practice slides and just go right to the summary and invite people um, to ask your questions. Um. So there is a question about well, what Bonnie in the Q&A is referring to as the opposite problem to what we were talking about with the kids getting anxious. She's saying her, her children are so very worried about her health. Mm. They call Question, or this is her client. They call in question all the time. The mom is getting concerned. They're acting as parentified children and mom feels uncomfortable. And so the, the kids are parentified in their concern for their kids, for, for, uh, for their mom. And, and who is the client? A, a client. A client. Yeah. So what do we do when kids are over? Oh, I'm over. Sorry, the mom is the client. I apologize. Yeah. Okay. So so mom is the client, and um, uh, so so I guess um, yeah. At the at the risk of um, of recommending an an approach, I I would say that <clears throat> if if what mom shares, and if I think of the MI work that we we did last week, if I think that a mom is sharing her concern about her kids being worried about her. I might stay with and ask a series of questions to kind of dig a little bit deeper about how that's coming about, what she notices about it and why she's mentioning it to you. Because I think in those responses, in that narrative and story would be a reflection of where she thinks that's coming from. And maybe it would help her to get to a place where she realizes that she is actually uh, very anxious and that what she needs is more stress reduction and and then maybe you could shift to helping her identify different coping or supports i think sometimes we as parents 
do a lot of that uh, management of our own stress with our kids and without proper boundaries that can burden them and, and parentification takes over. So maybe it's possible that she has other supports, other parents that she could talk to um, outside of um, when she's with her kids to be able to reduce some of that anxiety that they're experiencing. Um, but it does sound like it has to come from her. Um, and then there's an earlier question I, that um, I, I don't want to miss. Um, how are COVID-19 parameters, the parameters that have been laid out, affecting social support? How does one deal with being in public around people not wearing masks? Often they are children or adolescents around one's home and essential workers in stores not wearing masks as they work. Yes. That's well, a tricky question. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of the managing stress is to be able to take action in, on what we can control. Yeah. So the only thing that you can control and is under your control is to protect yourself by wearing your mask, by following the recommendations that we have been uh, given. Um, and maybe distance yourself when you see someone that is very close um, to you when you feel uncomfortable. I think it is important that you, we, we understand that this is a stressful moment and we need to, to take care of ourselves but controlling what we can, but setting expectations uh, for ourselves and for others and by, by, um, by setting boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that the, the, the evidence of the way in which social supports are changing will continue to, to thrive during COVID-19 um, and we'll hear more. So far what we're seeing is that the same kinds of supports are certainly working um, positively for, for frontline workers, but there hasn't been as much that's been written yet about this idea of the physical distancing. And as we, um, as we come back to um, reopening is the term that, that we've been hearing, but as we begin to reopen and we have to create new um, practices, it's not clear yet um, where the strengths will lie. But I think as, as Carolina is pointing out, it's, it's what we can control and the ways in which we um, use the four types of support that we have access to, to mitigate our own sense of negative stress, to turn it positively. And then there, there are a series of great questions about particular populations. So the kind of support for seniors afraid to leave their homes mm -hmm. uh, and then how teachers can deal with the new quote unquote normal once school actually starts, if, it's, it, if it actually starts, or how to deal or help people with disabilities who may need special equipment. Um, these are all really challenging questions that we'll have to address. Indeed, indeed. I, th I think, um, again, helping seniors, if it's, if it's possible to do a network map to, to uh, go through how they think about support and really the question of leaving one's home obviously has to do with safety and informational support related to how to keep a social distance and to be safe. Um, and, and finding good information, using good World Health um, Organization information or information that you trust that's vetted well from health professionals um, so that you can feel confident in uh, imparting that to them. And then there were a number of questions about the map itself, um, how um, a question related to how you show negative support in the map and um, uh, so the negative support, which we didn't put on, would come up red. So there's red, yellow, and green, and green is positive, yellow is neutral, and red is negative. So the negative supports show up in the same way, but the color is red. So we tried to use the universal um, red, yellow, green to indicate um, positive, negative, or neutral. And then Allison asked, do you want to make sure that someone actually has positive supports before using this tool. Uh, is there a chance that this would make someone feel more isolated if they don't have positive supports? So that's an excellent question. I'm going yes. to stop sharing. Um, 
Let's see if I can come up. I think one, one of the things that's amazing over the years that we've been using this and teaching with this tool is that um, it's really not possible for someone to have absolutely no social supports. And, and so, so what's really fabulous about the tool is helping people to identify supports where they didn't know they had them. And so what, what I mean by that is if someone can't name any person in the way we might because we live with someone or we have a neighbor, then you can ask about who they might see in a given day. Um, before COVID, it would be the, maybe the person where they buy their coffee or they get the paper or as they walk to the grocery store or a neighbor down the hall, whoever they might interact with. Now that we're living um, during COVID-19 and people are, um, are sheltered in place, it, it could be anyone they may be in touch with. If they're not in touch with anyone, then you are their positive support because you are in touch with them and you could start there. So I think that uh, rather than be afraid that what it would do would exacerbate one's concerns would be to try to also highlight, I know um, my, our colleague Amy Worman does a lot of work with pet therapy. So some people have pets and those are critical supports. For some people, spirituality, their God or their spiritual guidance or leaders may be forms of social support. So I would engage in a conversation about how um, any individual who appears so very isolated has coped in the past to help identify how they name or find or find meaning in a support and work with that. Also, there was a question both in the chat and in the Q&A having to do with whether this uh, map could be adapted for neighborhoods to assess collective efficacy and resources. Um, and uh, actually, we did a adapt your, your map, Susan, after September 11th to address those issues. It was relatively easy to do and straightforward, and it was mm -hmm. a wonderful tool just for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it has been uh, adapted uh, in, in the September 11th um, project, as Ellen was talking about, and it's actually also been adapted. Um, I will do some work to put together um, a PDF file or some URLs. There are other uh, versions of the map. Uh, for example, uh, there's one that we use for my colleague uh, Louisa Gilbert's WINGS intervention, which looks at domestic violence, which is a tree, essentially. Um, actually, no, she doesn't use the tree. We use that in South Africa. In South Africa, we have a, a network map that's a tree with branches, and the different individuals are put upon the tree as part of the the tree um, of life in their community. And for Louisa Gilbert's, it has uh, a number of birds in a, in a flock together for uh, women who've experienced domestic violence who are trying to identify potential supports to support them as they uh, make a safety plan. So we do have other versions and other ways of um, conceptualizing it. This is just one that's online, that's easy access that we thought we would try to use for today's talk to make it easily distributed. And then there's a very interesting question about introverts. Um, I've heard from self-described introverts that they are surprised at how much they are missing people since they aren't used to needing people. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've heard? And what would you recommend to someone whose natural instinct is not to be social? Carolina, you want to take that one? I, 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 I share with that person uh, that thought I have some friends who have said that they initially they feel very comfortable because they didn't have to talk to anyone. But I think this is a different situation because it's an imposed uh, social um, distancing or physical distancing. Uh, and I think that um, the The introverts, uh, without being an specialist on this, know that they have people who care about them, who love them, and um, and I think it's it's going to be it's it's hard to be um, even though it's hard to be separated. I think it's it's uh, I I lost my my train of thoughts. Susan can. Well, I'm, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm a self-prescribed um, introvert and, and I also have been very comfortable during this time and I'm aware of that. And I, but I still think that 
we even we introverts need to come back out and and interact and so i think I think around introversion, it depends again on what the person is asking for. So if the person mm -hmm. is feeling uncomfortable and realizing that they're, they're maybe too isolated to, to be curious, to ask, you know, what they think might make them feel uh, less isolated right now. And what is it that would um, feed their need? Um, I think many introverts suffer from, we suffer from anxiety in, in ways that we keep silent because we figure it's just part of our introversion. So drawing it out in a narrative or telling a story about what it is that's really concerning us can help bring it out and then figure out how to tackle it. Um, so, but I think that that observation is really keen that whether someone is more inter or, or extroverted, definitely temperamentally has had a different differential impact um, at this point. I also, I noticed that Marcus Burrell is um, sharing a lot about, um, I, I'm, I see Marcus, your chat, um, and, and this, I do want this to be a black friendly space. So I wish, um, I wish that we were looking there. I think your Q&A is coming up in the chat instead of in the, in the um, Q&A. And so I'm just watching it. But I do think um, absolutely that we need to um, apply the social support network map and to look in the black community, particularly around foster kids. I have a whole uh, module that we adapted for the class that we taught specifically about foster kids because we know how isolated they are and we know that they have a particular set of special needs. So I can share that information with you and or with anyone who's interested as well. We just didn't incorporate it today because we only had an hour. And uh, Marcus has also made some very, very interesting comments in the um, Q&A, um, referring to the reported death rates in New York City arguably do not account for the many deaths that have taken place in residential homes. Mm -hmm. This reporting has been a particular issue for African Americans. I would, res and he's saying, I would respectfully and lightly push back on the empirical conclusions drawn from the city's reporting. Um, and then also commenting, in addition, if you use disproportionality as the basis for comparing the group's death rates, um, African-American death rates will far outpace other ethnic groups, even if you can control for underreporting. So very critical observations. Yes. Um, so yes, I, don't I think, um, I think what, highlighting the particular population of the Latinx was in any, in any way um, a lack of recognizing the suffering of uh, black uh, communities. I think um, we particularly wanted to know, to talk about a population that we have worked with uh, directly, but we acknowledge and recognize that are the minority, the racial and ethnic minority populations who are uh, hit the, the most and, and the, the greatest with this pandemic. And it really emphasizes the structural inequality. So I think uh, um, it, it, the lack of um, emphasizing more on the black uh, community, it doesn't mean from our part, the recognition that we, we have about how they are suffering uh, alongside with minority populations. Yes, I think, and I think too, um, I do know we have an upcoming uh, talk that will be given, um, I believe, by Courtney Cogburn and Ovita Williams, where we'll be looking more in depth at those issues. But um, yeah, there's, there's so much to say about the white face uh, that has been put by the media on this pandemic, which is largely one of black and brown people. And it's very disconcerting. So I certainly hope, as Carolina was saying, that we didn't come across as not demonstrating uh, sensitivity to um, who is predominantly affected. Uh, we chose to target the Latinx community, uh, but we could do a whole series on the importance of the exacerbated inequities now during COVID-19, and we will attend to those issues moving forward in these talks. Thank you, Marcus. I think there were a total of 43 questions, so I tried to get no. to all of them. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, there was one interesting question. I don't know, we're a bit over time, so I don't know how long you would like to go, but uh, there was one very interesting question about the whether 
uh, how Zoom has affected social supports, positively or negatively. Yeah. I, again, I think I think the empirical literature is out is is not in yet. It's coming. It's coming quickly. But I think that what what we have seen in some of the published media has to do with the capacity for maintaining social support that uh, social media, including Zoom and Facebook and all others, have had. But what we're seeing uh, is also some of the concerns about the quality of interactions. So I would say that right now it's generally very positive, but the issue is the digital divide, right? Who has access to Zoom and who has access to Wi-Fi and internet and who has access to computers? So there's a great concern among certain communities, poor communities where we don't have access to technology. School systems have had to address this when they went to uh, sheltering and trying to continue education. Some have been successful in distributing computers, but others have not. So that's a great concern. Um, the fact that we're, many of us are becoming comfortable re relying on social media, we have to make sure that there's not an inequity in the digital divide if this becomes something that we now rely on. Um, I see someone is noting that DOE did give internet access and devices to all school age kids, including those during shelter. That's great to know. Um, I think it's not true everywhere in the country, but in New York City, um, there, it seems that there's been a response that's appropriate. Um, I guess what I would say, and Carolina, uh, let me know if you agree that if people have questions, please um, feel free to email us directly. We would be happy to respond, to send resources. As a follow-up, we'll post the slides and you do have access to the tool. And um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. And, and thank you for um, asking the many questions that you did to engender a real dialogue around this to help strengthen it. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Tiffany. All right. Thank Have you guys day, for everyone. Stay safe.